In this video, we're going to talk about the regiochemistry and stereochemistry of E2 eliminations, allowing us to carefully predict the products of E2 eliminations by considering how this reaction proceeds. And we're going to start with the regioselectivity issue. Now, this is a term you may or may not have heard before, regioselectivity or regiochemistry, so I wanted to touch on it a little bit. Regioisomers, in general, are formed in a reaction via the same mechanism occurring at distinct positions, giving rise to constitutional isomers generated through more or less the same reaction, just occurring at, at different places. And they're constitutional isomers, and that is important. If they're stereoisomers, we consider that an issue of stereochemistry. More often than not, particularly in the reactions you'll study in introductory chemistry, reactions are what we call regioselective, selective for a particular constitutional isomer, particular regioisomer, and the E2 elimination is no exception. In E2 elimination, the issue we have is that many alkyl halides contain distinct beta carbons with distinct beta hydrogens that could be deprotonated to produce constitutionally isomeric alkenes. And so we could get two, or in some cases, even three possible products of E2 elimination in many cases. And these multiple isomeric products are what we call regioisomers. The E2 reaction is regioselective. And in fact, by careful choice of base, as we'll see, we can generate either the more or less substituted product. And that's kind of the dimension on which we're thinking about this selectively. So take, for example, this alkyl halide in the middle of this slide. We've got these uh, beta hydrogens highlighted A in blue, associated with these two methyl groups, both of which are beta to the bromine. Notice we have the bromine, here's the alpha carbon, and we've got these two methyl carbons that are beta to the bromine. But we also have this CH2 group that is beta to the bromine, and it has two hydrogens, it's a methylene group, and we can label those B. Now, if we imagine removing any of these six chemically equivalent hydrogens, uh, protons, and uh, kicking off bromide in an E2 elimination, the product we get contains the, a double bond here between one of the carbons of the former, uh, former methyl carbons and this carbon that was bearing the bromine. This is a di-substituted double bond. We're going to return to that point in a second. And it arose through deprotonation at the less substituted position. There are more hydrogens here at this methyl group than there are at the methylene group here in B. We could also imagine deprotonating at B and kicking off the leaving group in an E2 step. This would lead to now a tri-substituted alkene known as the Zaitsev product. And the Zaitsev product is more stable And this point is made on the slide. The Zaitsev product is a tri-substituted alkene. It's more stable than the isomeric di-substituted Hoffman product that we have right here. And this may lead you to the conclusion that being more stable, the Zaitsev alkene, the more substituted alkene will form selectively. That's true in many cases, although it is possible for us by, by a careful choice of the base to generate the Hoffman product. This slide shows some experimental results that point to this idea that by carefully choosing the base we use, we can bias the reaction to generate the more substituted Zaitsev or less substituted Hoffman alkene selectively. If we use a relatively small, strong base like ethoxide, ETO minus, the more substituted Zaitsev product is the major product. And this is what we would expect on thermodynamic stability grounds. The Zaitsev product is more stable, it's more substituted, and it's the major product. However, if we introduce stearic bulk around that basic anionic oxygen atom, we see a switch in the selectivity for the Hoffman alkene, which is now the major product when we use tert butoxide, which is here, or this extremely bulky anion where we've taken tert butoxide and added another methyl group on the end of each of the carbons in, in tert butoxide, where we get 92% now of the less substituted Hoffman product. So what's happening here, pretty clearly, is we're increasing the steric bulk of the base. As we do that, we bias the reaction toward the less substituted Hoffman product. So relatively unhindered bases, methoxide, ethoxide, and hydroxide, OH minus, are going to lead to the Zaitsev product preferentially, the more substituted product. While relatively bulky bases, tert butoxide and bulkier than this, 
will give the Hoffman product selectively. And this ultimately comes down to the fact that for these bulky bases, they have a hard time accessing the more substituted carbon, which is a bit more sterically shielded, sterically crowded, and so kinetically, they'll go for the less substituted carbon or carbons first, leading to the less substituted alkene when a bulky base is used. Let's practice applying here our understanding of the regiochemistry of E2 reactions. And we're asked here to predict the major product of each of the following E2 elimination reactions. Now, how do we know that E2 is going to occur in preference to SN2? We're going to touch on that a little bit later, although we have already noted that more substituted alkyl halides, secondary and tertiary, will tend to undergo elimination with these strong hydroxide and alkoxide bases that we're seeing in these examples. So for instance, in the first example, this tertiary alkyl halide, notice one, two, three alkyl groups connected to the carbon bearing the iodine, is reacting with sodium hydroxide, and the active species here really in the reagent is OH minus. Now, OH minus is a relatively unhindered base, right? H is about as tiny as you can get when it comes to groups attached to oxygen. And so this OH minus will deprotonate at the less substituted position. Notice, uh, sorry, at the more substituted position. It's a CH2 group, the position with fewer hydrogens, if you like. And this will lead to the more substituted double bond, the Zaytsev product. That relatively small OH minus has no problem accessing the more substituted carbon, and this leads to the more thermodynamically stable tri-substituted double bond. In this case, we don't see any of the Hoffman product, which would contain a double bond here as opposed to here, and that would be a di-substituted double bond. In the second case here, we again have a tertiary alkyl halide. Now it's a chloride, and we've got two distinct positions where we could deprotonate this methylene or this methyl group. The two methylenes in the cyclohexane, by the way, are chemically equivalent to each other, so we could imagine working with either. We're going to get to the same product either way. The reagent we're using here is potassium tert-butoxide in terbutanol, and the active species here is the tert-butoxide anion. This is a bulky anion, right? It's going to have a hard time kinetically reaching that secondary um, CH as opposed to the methyl CH, and so it will preferentially go for the methyl CH deprotonating here and kicking off chloride with formation of a pi bond to give the less substituted Hoffman product, where we end up with a di-substituted double bond right here, as opposed to a tri-substituted double bond, which would come about if we de deprotonated at the methylene. And of course, if we switched to sodium hydroxide in the second reaction, we would indeed observe the Zaytsev product. So a good little piece of homework here is pause the video and draw the products that would form the major products if we switched the reagents, if we used NaOH in the bottom reaction and we used tert butoxide in the top reaction, what would the products look like? Elimination reactions often have stereochemical issues associated with whether the product has a cis or a trans double bond in it, right? There's the possibility of eliminating to give either a cis or trans product in many cases, and when one forms in preference to the other, the reaction is called stereoselective. When it comes to E2 elimination, this quite frequently occurs when we're eliminating at a methylene group, a CH2 group where elimination of, say, the red hydrogen versus the blue hydrogen could lead to cis or trans isomers. We already know that the trans isomer is more stable than the cis isomer, thermodynamically speaking, right? And it turns out also that the transition state energy leading to the trans isomer is lower than the transition state energy leading to the cis isomer, meaning the reaction is both kinetically favoring the trans isomer and thermodynamically favoring the trans isomer. The thermodynamics we've already touched on because of steric interactions in the cis isomer that are not present in the trans isomer, but the kinetic issue we can understand if we look at the transition states, and I want to just take a brief look at this. We'll see actually in the next couple of slides that the proton that is removed and the leaving group need to be arranged in an anti-periplanar arrangement like this in the transition state for E2 elimination. And in the transition state that leads to the cis isomer, we get a structure like this with the methyl group and the ethyl group cis to each other in the transition state. This is, these are going to flatten out and will end up in a cis alkene when the elementary step is done. When we eliminate the blue proton, however, notice that now the methyl and ethyl group are anti 
to each other and will end up in a trans relationship to each other in the product. The problem with this transition state is that the methyl and ethyl group are gauche to each other. This destabilizing gauche interaction is actually missing from the transition state that leads to the trans isomer because those groups are now anti. So the anti-arrangement of the methyl and ethyl groups makes this transition state lower in energy than this one, which is higher due to this gauche interaction between the methyl and ethyl groups. And this is a general result. Generally, when we eliminate at CH2s like this, if it's possible to form a cis or a trans isomer, the trans isomer will be favored. The E2 reaction is also stereospecific, and this becomes most apparent when we're eliminating at a stereogenic methine, a CH hydrogen is being eliminated where that carbon has three alkyl groups connected to it. In this case, we generally only observe a single stereoisomer of product, either exclusively cis or Z or exclusively trans or E. And if we switch the configuration, at that stereogenic center, the methine center, we get the opposite diastereomer of product. We switch from cis to trans or vice versa. So I want to show you an example of how this works, and then we'll dig into the explanation, the reasons why. So notice, for example, in this case, we, when we start with the 2R3S alkyl halide right here, with this particular configuration at this stereocenter, and this particular configuration at this stereo center, we end up with the E alkene, something that resembles a trans alkene, right? However, when I switch the configuration of the stereo center with the bromine, so that I'm now at the 2R3R isomer of starting material, I observe only the Z isomer, only the cis-like isomer, and none of the E isomer is observed, and in the first reaction, none of the Z isomer is observed. The thing to notice here is that these two alkyl halides are diastereomers. This is worth pausing to verify. They differ in configuration at one stereocenter, but not the other, so they're diastereomers. And these diastereomers give rise to diastereomeric alkenes. And switching a configuration causes a complete switch in the configuration of the product. This is what makes the reaction stereospecific. Now, why in the world does that happen? We're going to explore that on the next slide. E2 elimination is stereospecific because of its concerted nature. On a deep level, it's stereospecific for the same reason the SN2 reaction is stereospecific. With multiple electron flows happening simultaneously, there's a very particular alignment of orbitals that needs to occur in order for the reaction to take place at an appreciable rate. When it comes to the E2 reaction, we're forming a pi bond. And that pi bond is formed via the overlap of the CH sigma bonding orbital, which is filled, with the carbon leaving group antibonding orbital, which is empty. Overlap between these two orbitals ultimately leads to formation of a pi bond between the alpha and beta carbons in the E2 elimination. And on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see that in order for these orbitals to align, the sigma CH here in red and blue and the sigma star CX in yellow and green, in order for these to align, the CH bond needs to be parallel to the CX bond, but anti to it, so that the large lobes are aligned. Notice this quite large blue lobe in the bonding orbital is aligned with the larger green lobe in the anti-bonding orbital only when the CH and CX bonds are in an anti-periplanar alignment. So E2 elimination only occurs when we have this alignment of the deprotonated hydrogen and the leaving group in an anti-orientation like this. Fantastic. We see that, for example, in this case in this Newman projection, with this CH up and the bromine down, the other substituents are positioned to reflect these configurations in the starting material. In essence, we're lining things up so that the CH and carbon-bromine bond are anti-periplanar to each other. And then we lay down the rest of the substituents to ensure that the R configuration at carbon-2 and the S configuration at carbon-3 are maintained. That gives rise to this Newman projection. This is the conformation in which the reaction takes place. And so in the product, we're going to end up with this methyl group, cis to 
the turd butyls, since they're on the same side of this sort of purple line we've drawn through the groups that are eliminated, and the phenyl and H will end up cis to each other. And in fact, that's exactly what we observe in this product that we get. In the second case now, we've again switched the configuration at this stereocenter bearing the bromine. And so what changes here is the position of the turd butyl group and the H. Notice H is now where the turd butyl group was sitting, and the turd butyl group is sitting where the H was sitting. So we changed the configuration of that back carbon, left the front carbon exactly the same. We still need an antiperiplanar arrangement of the H and bromine, CH and CBr bonds more specifically, for E2 elimination to take place. But now the turd butyl group is cis to the phenyl ring, and that relationship in the transition state will be maintained in the product. And sure enough, the Z product is the one we observe here. So the stereospecificity of E2 comes from this requirement for the CH and C leaving group bonds to be anti-periplanar. Quite frequently, what you'll have to do is apply this idea to predict the product. Here we're just rationalizing an observation, but quite frequently it'll be up to you to, for example, draw this Newman projection based on the structure of the starting material, and in particular, the configurations. And it's important here to avoid accidentally changing configurations by laying things down the wrong way in this transition state, and sort of more fundamentally to the E2 reaction, making sure that the CH eliminated is anti-periplanar to the carbon leaving group bond.